Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Tune In Tuesday. It's McKenna again. Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about a very important topic, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the job search. We are so fortunate to have Colette from Bremer Bank as our guest. She is a talent and finance enthusiast and a leader in inclusion, equity, and belonging. So let's get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Colette, uh, Colette Campbell, and I am from Bremer Bank. And I'm excited to be here with you today. I've never done this before where I've recorded myself, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so I'm from Bremer Bank, and I was asked to do a presentation on how to be what you can't see. A lot of this presentation is really um, about my, my, my story, uh, both personally and professionally. And then um, I want to, at the end, go into some questions that um, Career Services had and asked me to maybe respond to. So, um, as I said, my name is Colette and I serve as the Senior Vice President of Talent Acquisition, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Bremer Bank. I've been there now for about three years and prior to joining Bremer, I was actually in higher education and I was um, a professor and I also had a consulting business, which I really enjoyed. Um, had the opportunity to work with different companies and think about uh, working better together. Um, so I did a lot of variety of things from helping people think about um, just interactions that they have with one another, but also thinking about their teams and who are in their teams um, and their own career development. So uh, I think as young adults navigating this, you know, just this journey of college, you're, you're thinking about um, your future as you're kind of live in, trying to live in the present. And um, there's always a tension in that, right? Like, are you doing the right thing to prepare for, for your future? And uh, I, I think we never know that, but we just have to kind of be, I would say, diligent with what we have um, with us at the time. So uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up, I was born and raised in Canada. Uh, by Jamaican immigrant parents. And this picture here is my mom. And uh, uh, I wanna share a little bit of her story with you because I think uh, there's a, a lesson in that for all of us. And so my mom grew up, was born and raised in Jamaica and lost her parents at a really early age. Um, and as, as a, a young person who doesn't have parents as an orphan, um, there's there's a lot of other significant challenges that come with that. But uh, as a young adult, she was working um, at a college doing laundry as well as farming because they had a small farm, which is what was their livelihood. And my mom was the matriarch of her family. So the oldest daughter who kind of became a mom to her, her siblings, but um, so had to have a lot of different things to help provide for her family. And during that time, as she was working uh, her multiple jobs, but working at the college, she met uh, a professor and became good friends with her. And um, this professor was going to be moving to uh, Canada of all places and told my mom, you know, I know your life is really hard here, but when I go to Canada, um, if, if I have the chance, I'd love to offer you an opportunity to come and maybe start a new life in a new country and, and maybe have some more opportunities. And, and at that point, that was a really pivotal um, time and uh, invitation that was presented to my mom. And like all of us, we've got times where we're presented with something and we have to make a choice. Do I do something new and different or do I stay with what I know and feel safe? And fortunately, my mom actually decided to do something different and she made the decision to, um, you know, leave her, leave what was comfortable and what she knew. And she went um, to Canada. And so that was a, that was a very big, <laughs> very big decision. But that decision not only changed her life, it changed the trajectory of her siblings because she ended up bringing all of them over. And it changed the trajectory of my life. Um, again, living in a really rural place, um, working poor, I would say, 
uh, she wasn't going to have a lot of opportunities. And for her to, to take that chance really changed the course of her direction of her life and mine. So I want to ask you, when was the last time you were extended an invitation? And when was the last time you said yes to an invitation? You maybe also want to think about the flip side. When was the last time you said no to an invitation? And then what did that mean? Um, so I told you a little bit that I was from Canada, so not too far from here, but really some differences. I lived in a place uh, close to Toronto, and if you know anything about Toronto, it's kind of like a mini New York, very multicultural, very eclectic, and I feel very fortunate to actually have had that experience there. Um, I always had a desire uh, to, to see the world, though. Uh, I think maybe growing up in such a multicultural place, you meet people from all over the world. And so um, I, I wanted to explore. And unlike maybe some of you right after high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I took at that time what we call now a gap year. I just took a year off because I didn't know what to do. Um, school was quite expensive and uh, I wasn't sure exactly what that looked like for me. Um, but I did take some time off and um, I actually went back to school and got my, um, my degree, uh, but still didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I, I wanted to travel and I got this invitation, an opportunity to um, go to South Korea. And I did not know anybody in South Korea, but I knew that um, I wanted an experience where I could travel, get to see another part of the world and maybe pay off some debt. And so again, there was invitation that was given to me. I didn't know anybody in Korea. I didn't know anybody who had done that, but kind of like with my mom's courage, I took the risk and I said, okay, I'm gonna go there. I did have people in my community who you can see I'm a black woman. They said, who's gonna do your hair in Korea? And they were right. I had no idea who was gonna do my hair in Korea. Um, I actually had to figure out how to do my own hair, but then eventually I made friends with different people. There's a lot of US Army folks there and you figure things out. And so one thing that I wanna share with you is that sometimes we don't know every single piece of how something's gonna happen. But you've got to trust that things are going to work out. People are going to come around you and um, you'll figure out those things. Um, next thing I want to let you know is that I think in our lives, just like, you know, we've got to make goals and, and sometimes those can be short term and long term. Um, and for me, when I was in high school, I knew I wanted to, well, actually I didn't even want to, but I knew I needed a degree. I felt like I needed a degree to probably show up in professional spaces that I wanted to be in. And so that was a goal. Um, I also had a goal after being in Korea that I wanted to travel and see more of the world. And so my goal for myself was I wanted to do 30, travel to 30 countries before I was 30. And I would share that with people and they'd say, that's crazy. And for some reason, crazy didn't scare me. I wanted to do that. And so um, I had the opportunity to do that. So by the time I was 30, I had gone to 30 different countries. And that was a real, I think when you, when you meet small goals, you can meet bigger goals. And so I want to challenge you to say, what is that big thing that's ahead of you that you've always wanted to do? Put it out there and go for it. And you can start into smaller things. I think that is totally fine to do. But, but make, create opportunities, create goals for yourself, because then you will, you, will, um, you will move forward to achieving them. And I can sometimes think too, being, being what you can't see um, or, or accomplishing dreams that you haven't seen somebody else do before. Again, there's not a roadmap, but you, you will figure it out. And maybe in another workshop, I can tell you a little bit more about what it's like to, and maybe when we're out of COVID <laughs> traveling um, like I did, but I did it on a shoestring. It was probably one of the best things I could have done. Um, people sometimes would say, oh, just wait till you're more, um, you know, till you, till you have a steady job until you have this. But all of those things, if I had a steady job, I wouldn't leave a steady job to go travel. And so I'm glad that I did those things when I did them. But like anything, there are risks and there are things that you give up. Um, 
when I was 30, I didn't have a lot of things that my friends had. I didn't have a home, a house that I had bought or anything like that. I have all those things now. I just got to them a little bit later. And so when you make different choices, it means that different things will, will happen. And I, I want to put that out there too. Okay, so I don't know if you've ever seen this lady or if you've been watching the Netflix series, but I really loved it. Her name is Marie Kondo. And um, she wrote a, a book called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And um, I love it because what, what she encourages her uh, viewers to do is think about what gives you joy. What are you holding on to? that you um, are just holding on to and it's, it's taking up space. And as college students, that could be people in your life who maybe served you at a certain time. They were partiers and they were really fun, but maybe you want to move on in your, who you are as a young person and develop yourself. And maybe you need some new friends. And so sometimes it's, you know, be, being grateful for that time and the experiences they gave you then, but moving on. Sometimes it's just, um, you know, sometimes it's actually things that uh, as you moved to, to UW River Falls, there were some things that you couldn't bring from home to this new space. And so we're always being asked in life to think about what are the things that we're holding on to that maybe aren't serving us anymore and what new things do we need to grab onto. And so one of that, that's one of the things that I love about Marie Kondo and that she challenges me to think about. And I really want to challenge you as you are moving in your lives to think about what things are you holding on to that you might want to let go of so that you can live and, and grow. Um, next slide. So will you go first? So I shared with you um, before about just being first uh, of doing things. So in my family, um, as I shared that my mom immigrated and so did my dad actually from, you know, these countries to some a new place and being first. They didn't know anybody. Well, they, they knew of people. That's how they got to where they were going. But, you know, they were the first maybe in their family. Um, and maybe some of you are the first. Maybe some of you are the first to go to college. Maybe some of you are the first to, um, for many things, whatever that means, maybe major in something that nobody in your family has majored before. Maybe you're... Um, considering, you know, doing something that you are really excited about, but you're, you're not exactly sure how to get there. It's scary. Nobody wants to go first. You want to let somebody else try it, make the mistakes. And sometimes that's okay. But sometimes we're given the invitation to try it and to, and to go for it. And so as much as you're scared, I want you to lean into what that might look like for you. I love that picture of those kids. They're so cute. Um, I wanted to share this next picture with you. So, you know, for my mom, I'm sure she wasn't thinking through a ton of, of, of things, um, but I, I'm sure there were, there were some of those future aspirations that made her make the choice that she made so many years ago to leave an island that she knew and to venture into something else. And I know that she was thinking of her future family and the things that um, she maybe never got to experience as a young person because she didn't have parents. And so here's what I want for my daughter. Here's what I want for my um, future children to experience. And, and the same is true, um, I think for all of us, I know for me, that was true and growing up in the, the 80s, I loved watching like the Cosby show and some of these, these shows, um, uh, A Different World. And even though I grew up in a very multicultural place, I didn't grow up in a place where there were a lot of people of color in my high school. Um, and I had always heard of this cotillion. And um, another time, which I, I'll share with you a little bit later, but I lived in South America and I saw uh, they had a quinceanera. So when a young woman becomes of age and they throw this celebration and there's a lot of traditions and cultures that throw a celebration of coming of age. But in the African-American community, there's something called the debutante ball and the 
tell you that I thought if I ever had a daughter, I'd love her to experience something like that. And uh, last year, um, for the first time in I think over a decade, um, Minneapolis had a cotillion, and so our daughter got to participate in that. But it's a time and a celebration of people coming together in the Black community and um, announcing the, um, you know, the involvement, the, the, the fact that their child is coming of age and that is an adult. And so her daughter was, was in that. And I share this with you because I think all of us have dreams for ourselves and dreams for our future um, family or friends or whatever that might look like for you. And sometimes those things can drive us into to moving forward. And so um, this was one of those things that, that did that for me. Um, as you all know, and we're all experiencing right now with COVID, there are different seasons in our lives that bring different, um, different opportunities, different challenges, different things for us to show up in different ways. And, and life is like seasons constantly changing um, and and we've got to figure out how to be ready for that um, goodness knows I was not ready for the snow that we are experiencing right now in fact we just bought a new home and I've got a dog and we we're gonna build a fence and you'd think that in uh, mid-October that would work out and sure enough five inches of snow came and so just as we had dug the holes to put uh, the poles in them five inches of snow came <laughs> And so you've got to adapt, you've got to be agile, you've got to, um, you know, take what you're given and figure it out. And that's going to happen in your life. And that's going to happen um, all, you know, and you've just got to, you've got to be able to be agile and adapt. And here's the other thing, seasons change. So you've got to trust that you're not going to stay in that place, whether it's a tough place or an amazing place. It's not going to be stagnant. Things are going to change. And um, figure out the resources that you need. Maybe, maybe you're thinking about even the community that you have now and knowing that you need to add more people who give you more support, more people who are really helpful. Um, I encourage you to seek that out because uh, we all need some. We all need resources to help us get through. So I wanted to share in, in light of this whole idea of seasons, um, there was a time in my life where I felt like things were going really well. I was in a great career. I was just about um, hoping to get tenure in a position in higher education. And my husband got this opportunity to, um, to go to Guatemala and uh, was a, applied for a Fulbright scholarship, which, you know, to be honest, I didn't think he would necessarily get works in the technical college space. And um, I just, I wasn't, didn't really think it would have happened for us, but it did. And it was this pivotal time where, again, I was kind of at the height of my career. And this opportunity came for my husband, which we've got three kids, a bird and a dog. And it meant his, his, decision was going to really alter our decision, our life. And so it wasn't easy, but um, I felt like I was making some sacrifices. But again, there are always, there's always opportunities. And so one thing, I, you know, I'm always dreaming, thinking ahead. I thought I actually really love um, this channel. I don't know if any of you do, but it's HGTV, Home and Garden TV. And I love these house hunter shows and so um I've, I've always watched them and we had lived in our home prior to moving this home for about 18 years and after year five i was done with that home but lots of circumstances made it that we stayed there and so i would watch this show as my escape show looking at people looking at houses and dreaming along with them and so when we were gonna to move to Guatemala, I thought, oh, maybe this is my chance to do something. I mean, I'm gonna write the show and say, hey, I'm coming there and we need a house. My husband thought I was crazy. Everybody thought I was crazy, but you know what? You gotta do things sometimes. And I did, and I wrote that show. We were looking for a home, looking for a home, couldn't find a home. Finally, uh, about two months into it, which was a little too long, um, really was struggling 
kind of at the end thinking, okay, we're gonna just have to settle. I get a call from New York, totally thinking it was a joke that one of my friends had set us up and it was House Hunters International. And so we've got this great episode, um, Midwesterners go to Guatemala, if you ever wanna see that. But remember, reality TV isn't reality. They made me look like a diva, but it was very fun. <laughs> Um, okay. So talk about changing times, having to figure out, figure it out. So our daughter was a senior in uh, high school last year when COVID hit the pandemic and people had to pivot how we were doing everything, work, education. And I felt so badly for our daughter because she had this not ideal uh, senior experience. And, um, you know, we were trying to figure out how do we commemorate this time. And even though we were in the backyard on the deck watching her commencement through YouTube, which was not fun, um, we ended up doing something kind of fun for her. And this is a money crown that somebody made. And uh, I just love it. But, you know, all of us, it doesn't matter who we are in our lives at different stages whether you're young like our daughter Lily here, or old like me, older like me, um, or in your stage of life, when you are handed something, you've got to figure out what are you going to do with it? How are you going to make this experience new, something you've never seen before? And so even though we're talking about how to be maybe something you've never seen, you also have to figure out how do you navigate something nobody's ever navigated before. Um, I just think that we've got to, we, 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 we've got to, um, we've got to hold these things, but we've also got to be aspirational. We've got to, I think, have a hope in us that is maybe deeper than ourselves, that there, that it, that it will work out. And so what can you do in this meantime so that you're ready for when, um, things change and open up in, in maybe different ways. Maybe it'll never open up the same way, but but things are going to change and there's going to be opportunities. So are you going to be ready? Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about what I get to do at Bremer. In my role, um, which again, if you know a little bit, if you've heard a little bit about my story, I'm not the kind of person who loves to go into anything that's totally mapped out. I kind of like to make things and create them. And so, um, after coming back from Guatemala, I was teaching a little bit in HR and I was doing consulting work, but I wanted to do, I wanted to be a part of an organization. And this role came up at, at uh, Bremer and it wasn't really totally defined. They said, here's what we want, big picture. And so I got to kind of have the opportunity to create and, and think this through. And so my work really falls into three buckets. I think about the workforce who we're hiring and how. Think about um, who's here right now in our footprint in the, as our employee base, what our demographics are in those areas, and are we reflective of the communities that we're a part of? And then I think about the workplace. How does it feel when people are there? Do we promote a sense of belonging? Um, the people that are there and the people that are coming in that are new, do they feel like they can bring their best selves and, and be productive? And then I think about the marketplace. I think about, are we engaging communities? Our, our mission at Bremer is cultivating thriving communities. And we've been really asking ourselves, you know, particularly in light of George Floyd's killing, and, you know, are all of our communities thriving? How do we become a, a place, a financial services institution that just shows up and, and partners in the right way? So that's the work that I get to do at Bremer, which I'm really grateful for. I also get to go out and challenge people to think about what kinds of careers are there in financial services. It's it's really broader and bigger than I think people um, understand, but there's there's a there's probably something of interest for you there. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about our diversity statement and where we're at as a bank. Um, and we really believe that there's strength through diversity and that there's access through equity and respect through inclusion. 
So as a relationship bank, we embrace and celebrate differences, knowing that multiple points of view inspire creativity, innovation, and relevance. And we connect with one another by seeing and being seen, by listening and being heard, by trusting and being trusted. We show up for our customers as the genuine, caring individuals we are, making sure everyone we serve feels welcomed and valued. As a reflection of the communities where we live and work, we aspire to further enrich our culture by fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion, building on the legacy of our immigrant founder. So I'm not sure what you know about Bremer Bank, but um, at Bremer, our founder, founder Otto Bremer, was um, a German immigrant who came to um, Minnesota and with his aunt and didn't have means, um, but you know wanted to to start something and so worked at the German American Bank, um, started a company, and really wanted to leave a legacy where he could um, do something to alleviate the poor and so. Our, our ownership structure is quite unique in that the majority of our profits go to um, a trust which serves the community. And it's such an amazing um, organization to be a part of. So lastly, I wanna tell you that talent is universal, but opportunity isn't. And so whether you are the person that is giving opportunity <laughs> Or receiving opportunity, you're going to be in both of those places throughout your life, and it's really important that you um, that you figure out ways that you can give back and give to um, to others. And so, I just want to encourage you with that. I want to also um, I also want to I think talk through. There were some questions that. Um, that the career services asked me to, to maybe address um, as I was talking with you today. And so I just want to head, go to those really quickly as I wrap up. Um, but I guess questions that some of you have been asked recently in interviews, the person, uh, so this is pivoting as you're moving into the, the workspace and trying to navigate your professional careers, people are going to ask you questions about um, diversity and inclusion because I really want to, you know, as we think about professionalism, leadership, um, DE&I is not something that is negotiable, like it's everywhere. If you're working in egg, John Deere, in any kind of industry, that is an initiative because our world is changing, um, our demographics are changing, and it's important that we know how to work with each other. And diversity might be in terms of our personality, of our talents. It might be in terms of our gender, of our abilities, um, it, whether, you know, dominant culture or minorities, we've got to figure out how to work with each other. So whether you're an employee or you're in a manager or you're an owner of something, we've got to figure out how do we work with each other. And that's what companies want to know. They want to know, do you have the ability to work with other people? Do you have those um, ability in terms of emotional intelligence competencies? Can you, can, you, can you read people well? Can you understand emotions? Can you understand your emotions? Do you know how to, to navigate that? These things are very, very important. Um, so uh, let's see. How do you define internal bias? Please give an example of internal bias in your professional role and what steps you take to address it. Okay, so everybody has bias, number one. A lot of people don't maybe want to talk about that. <laughs> just like people might not say, I mean, they, they, just, they just don't, but we all do. It's a human condition um, that we've been given to survive, right? So fight or flight. We've been given certain biases, even around food. We don't really like things that are too bitter or sour because, you know, back in the day, those things would have killed us. And so we've got these internal things that um, that make us maybe a little bit more adverse to, to certain tastes or things. And as people, we gravitate to people who are like us, right? People who might have similar um 
people who might have similar tastes or political views or whatever. But the, the opportunity is if you're only with people who are exactly like you, it's going to be hard to, to be objective, to have innovation, to, to and it's, it's important that we know how to listen to other points of views, to be respectful, um, but to also call out things that are true, right? Um, what has happened and what in terms of a lot of the um, the the social justice and the unjust things that have happened in terms of systematic oppression um, in certain groups, it's led to some disruption. And those are important things to understand. I don't know, as you're listening today, what that means for you, but I encourage you to lean in and, and, and start having conversations and figure out what your trigger points are, because as professionals, we've got to figure out how to navigate and deal with that. And it's not okay to say that those things don't exist. Um, because when we, when we minimize differences, that differences make a difference. And so Sometimes people like to say, oh, I'm colorblind or I don't see that. But if you're colorblind, that means that you don't want to see what you don't want to see, right? If you see me and you tell me I don't see color, then I think either maybe you are like visibly colorblind or you're choosing not to, to see that, which is also problematic because you're not choosing to see all of it. Um, and so I want to challenge you and encourage you to, to lean into understanding. Um, student questions. Here's some questions that students have combined. What are some questions that I can ask an employer to gauge um, how diversity is valued in your workplace? I think you could just ask that. How is diversity valued in the workplace? What kinds of efforts do you have? Um, I can tell you that, and I don't know if there's a right answer for that. Um, at Bremer, we don't have a lot of ERGs, which are employee resource groups. For some people, that might be really important, you know, where they have different, um, you know, maybe a woman in networking group, or um, I, I was doing some work with Microsoft, Blacks at Microsoft, like those kinds of things might be really important for you. Um, so that might be something. Um, people always know kind of what the demographic makeup is. And so if somebody asks us, what does Bremer look like? Like for you, it might be that there's a good gender balance. Um, for us at Bremer, we're about 70% female, which is pretty large for a financial institution. But if that was something that was important to, to someone, then that might be something that gets people in our doors. If you're asking about minority representation, our numbers are not at all on par. They're, they're quite, you know, I would say we, we've got about 10% minority diversity. And so for some people that might also, that might not be what they want or, um, so it just depends. But those are, you know, first of all, figure out what you value before you ask that question. Because if you ask that question, an employer will want to understand a little bit more. Um, what are some questions related to diversity and inclusion that I, as the job candidate, should be prepared to, to answer? I think, as I said um, earlier, I would say a professional competency, just like conflict resolution is, um, working well in teams, cultural competency is a competency of the 21st century. So, so what does that mean for you? That's important, and that might mean I work well with in teams, it might mean um, I know, you know, maybe it's Strength Finder or DISC or something like that. But maybe it's understanding, um, you know, the struggles in the community that you're a part of or that you're going to, that you understand that there is that there is differences and, and what does that look like in mean? You people aren't looking. I don't think organizations are looking that you're an expert. I think that they're looking that you're a learner. I think that they're looking that you're curious. I think that they're looking that you're willing to, to lean in. Um, I think those things are important. I think when people come in thinking that they know it all or have it all figured out or that they're not, whatever that word is, like I'm not biased, that would set off alarms to me. <laughs> 
because everybody is. Um, and I would, if somebody said that, I would think that they're not, um, they don't really understand the topic or themselves. So I think that there's a, I think it's really important that you, you don't have to say that you're an expert. I think all of us are evolving. So I would say that there has to be a posture of humility. Um, that's one of the big things in, in this work. How as a non-marginalized person to answer uh, experiential questions um, that if you've not experienced discrimination? Well, I think one of the things, you know, in that topic or that question is if you are um, a, a dominant culture person or a white person and, and there's a question around discrimination, I think all of us, regardless of who we are, have have experienced what it feels like to be an, in an in-group or in an out-group, right? And so speak to what you know. Um, I mean, I think everybody's had an experience where they've gone somewhere and they felt like they didn't know anyone or they felt like people maybe were looking at them because they were the that new person. Um, you might not have the exact experience of discrimination or being marginalized, but hopefully there's some empathy that you can have there of, of what it feels like to not belong. And um, I think that can give some empathy and help to, to start having the conversation. I do want to encourage you though, that there are so many resources out there. So depending on where you're at in this conversation or this topic, there is a place for you. Um, lean in, read. There's so much on YouTube or out there that you can watch on video that are short snippets of things. It's really important that you do your learning, that you, just like anything else, it's important that you, that you get educated in this, that you get, that you start learning in this, because this is a, a professional competency that is of the 21st century and it's not an excuse to, to not know or to be clueless. So, um, that's what I would encourage you. Yeah. And if you have any other questions, let me know. It was great being with you this afternoon. And um, thanks again for the time. Bye-bye.